I didn't see you there. You know, video games have really come a long way, ever since the arcade days when... Boss Battles! Normally the most climactic part of the game, nothing be scraping your way through tons and tons of minions only to confront the big bad boss at the end. Whether they be the guy in charge or just an exceptionally powerful enemy, boss battles are always a memorable and tense encounter. As you'd expect, this list will largely cover bosses from my own experience, and I'll be putting timestamps in the description in case certain sections happen to be too spoiler heavy. Also, I don't like to repeat myself or others, so for that reason, a handful of qualifying bosses were snubbed. Sorry about that. Well, I hate to waste any more time, so without further ado, this is my top 10 boss battles. Super Mario Galaxy. The world wasn't big enough to contain the Jumpman sleeps forward, so we took to the stars. The thrill of discovery, the sense of wonder, an infinite cosmos ripe to plunder. It's weird to think that Mario literally interacts with aliens in this game, so they don't seem that different from the denizens of his own world. Heck, the Outer Wilds even have their very own Mario spooky manor, filled to the brim with space ghosts. Coast to coast. <laughs> Guarding the third star of the aptly titled Ghostly Galaxy, Boulder Geist is among the most intimidating Mario bosses ever. It attacks by summoning spiky stones from the ground that stick around until destroyed, and periodically throwing rocks at you. From the black rocks appear bomb boos, which you can grab and swing into the boss to damage it until eventually the weak point, its uvula, is exposed, and you have to give chase while it evades you. Yikes, how brutal is that? We swing explosives into its face until its jaw comes off, and then we smack its throat with a bomb too. Yeesh, that probably hurt. Anyway, after ditching the final blow, the boss reforms, only with a new pair of hands, which you can now use to punch and crush you on top of blocking attacks on the head. And even when you destroy the hands, they'll reform after a short period of time. Plus, your shot can also be blocked by the spikes and even other bomb boos, so landing a decent hit can be tricky once the fight has gone chaotic enough. And lest we forget about the infamous rematch of this fight, where the Daredevil Prankster Conf is this ghostly galaxy, thus requiring to be Boulder Geist without getting hit. Which, as you may have guessed, from the stones, to the spikes, to the bomb boos, to the hands, has given Boulder Geist a bit of a reputation as a crazy tough boss, as just one out of place stone can spell your end. And I have to say, it's quite exhilarating. There is some Something so gratifying about swinging these bamboos into the boss's face and watching it gradually suffer a worse and worse case of tooth decay before its armor falls off completely and becomes scared of you. Yeah, who's the big scary monster now? I dared the devil when the devil wouldn't dare. Day, the subspace emissary from Super Smash Brothers Brawl remains the most ambitious official video game crossover in history. It's truly Brawl's greatest feat, interweaving so many characters and having them play off each other to a degree that had never been matched before or since. And likewise, it also came with an all-star roster of bosses. There's Duon, Porky, Ridley, Meta Ridley, Rayquaza, who all make for pretty menacing encounters, and Gallium and Petey Piranha were both so iconic that they snuck their way into Ultimate. Hmm, I can't pick one. Wait, there is one boss I left out that I believe stands tall above the rest. One so strong, so incendiary that it can easily make your existence as forbidden as its own name. Taboo, the Cosmic Butterfly of Subspace. Taboo is one of the most enigmatic characters in the entire Nintendo canon. Even now just looking at him, it's hard to believe he's real. In a connected universe filled to the brim with colorful characters, it comes as a shock that the big bat of Brawl is what appears to be an adult man made of data with a closed off posture and beauteous rainbow wings. 
Onto the fight itself, Taboo is an absolute nightmare with an impressive variety of attacks that range from cosmically wild to savagely brutal. Taboo can turn into a large fish-like blade that cuts across the stage, surround himself with electricity, blast with a huge beam of energy, teleport around and even leave explosions in his wake, grow to a gargantuan size and fire lasers from his eyes, catch you in a heavenly bracelet before slamming you into oblivion, fire a barrage of bullets and then a medium-sized explosion from his hand, cut across the ground with a blade of sharpened plasma, slice at you at rapid fire speed, spawn a bombardment of combustible clones all around him, fire a large shuriken of energy that comes back, create explosions with a flick of his finger, he even has a whoa 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 holy shit! And then of course there's Taboo's most infamous attack, the off waves, where Taboo unfolds its wings and releases three continuous blasts of energy across the entire stage, which if they hit you will result in a nearly guaranteed KO. This attack is monstrous, it's his strongest move and fittingly the one he used to knock out every fighter at once earlier in the story. And I remember when I played this fight as a kid, it always got me, because I didn't know how to spot dodge or roll the time, which is the only way to avoid this attack. So in total, that is around 15 different attacks, most of which kill you in one hit, especially on higher difficulty settings. And given Taboo's whole strategy of teleporting around and floating in the air when he's not attacking, landing a substantial hit on him can be tricky. It's a real tongue-biting encounter as you avoid incredibly powerful attacks while slowly chipping away the boss's health. And let's not ignore the music. Now this is what I call a final boss theme. Come on, with a boss roster this great, how could I possibly leave out Undertale? Undertale is an incredibly subversive RPG where the enemy's attacks take the form of these bullet hell sections, with you dodging attacks in the space provided. But then when you get to most of the boss fights, the boss flips the script by changing your soul to a different color and by extension the rules of what you can do. Undyne changes your soul green, thus locking you in place and forcing you to block attacks with a shield. The pirate turns your soul blue, making you abide by the laws of gravity so you have to jump over obstacles. And as an odd mix of both, Muffet turns your soul purple, thus sticking to three lines of webbing that you have to hop between to avoid her attacks. She throws spiders at you, which go in a straight line, donuts that bounce along the edges, and even croissants which boomerang around. Side note, the game says the croissants look like incredibly powerful bracelets, but I always thought they looked like helmets. You know, am I crazy? And then after a couple turns of this, she sticks her pet on you, and you have to climb up the box while it's being devoured in this pretty intense display. As the fight continues, the bullet spreads get faster and faster and more intense and claustrophobic as you cut and weave, no pun intended, between your attacks. The best part is how you can actually cough up some of your money to make Muffet go easy on you, and then after doing it the first time, she marks up the price considerably. Honestly, it might still be worth it, since the fight can be pretty tough if you're not careful. Ah, uh, jeez, I really took a beating that last turn. Let's see, what do I got? Oh, perfect. Hey, Muffet, do you mind if I borrow a pot? I also considered Menerton for this list, it was close, but I picked Muffet. The fight with Menerton is incredibly involved and dramatic and it has the best song in the game, only problem is that that fight has been talked about to death already. Luckily for me, there just so happens to be another dramatic boss in Hotland that is the other best song in the game. As the fight goes on, Muffet is constantly bobbing to the beat of this theme and the flavor text even says the spiders clap along to the music. And how could you not, it's just so damn sick! The fight eventually ends with Muffet receiving a telegram from the spiders in the room saying that you're, hey, not so bad. And if you bought one of their products back then, you could even end the fight early by eating it right at the start. Afterwards, in true Undertale fashion, you can show the enemy a little mercy. Or not. This 
villains are great, aren't they? After slaving your way through the campaign, you reach the end and find out that one character you overlooked at the start was actually the final boss all along. I know it's a pretty tired trip in the movie scene, but in video games, it hits different, since it comes to the realization that you now need to deal with the surprise enemy. And even as you slowly piece together the set on assuming character is about to turn on you, that doesn't erase the fact that you'll need to face them eventually. And it's that build-up, that sense of anticipation that can create a truly horrifying encounter. Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, the greatest RPG in the history of ever has a couple good bosses. Duplis is supremely subversive as he steals your party and uses your own moves and allies against you. Cortez is incredibly intimidating, goes through a bunch of different phases before just saying screw it and devouring the souls of your audience. And Macho Grubba manages to be a more disturbing foe than the both of them combined. When we're first introduced to Grubba, we only know him as the head honcho of the Glitz Pit, which you need to rise the ranks of in order to have the Crystal Star. But then as the chapter continues, some disconcerting things begin to occur. King K, this guy you engage in friendly conversation with after each match and really come to know, just vanishes at one point. Nowhere to be seen. Andy Andy here is a lot of gossip to share about Grubba in the pit. Like how the guy is surprisingly young despite being in his 60s, as well as how lots of young fighters apparently go missing from time to time. And then later on, we find both Andy and King K on the floor of one of the storage rooms, apparently having had the life sucked out of them, with Andy warning us not to enter the ring when no one is around. This all builds to the climactic confrontation with Grubba, who admits to everything. At first you think that Rockhawk is going to be the chapter boss, being the rank one fighting the Gliss Pit, and a bit of a shady character himself, so then it comes as a complete shock when Grubba, the manager, turns out to be the real boss of chapter 3. Whereas the fights in the Gliss Pit are normally accompanied by huge screaming crowds, booming music, and action displayed on the Jumbotron, here the seats are empty, the music's more sinister, and the display only shows static. The atmosphere is incredibly chilling, as we're essentially alone with an E-rated serial murderer who needs us out of the picture, so to speak. Grubba ain't all talk, neither. His whole gimmick is that he constantly gives himself buffs, whether it be extra defense, evasiveness, boost to his strength, and even extra turns. Normally what he'll do is begin by giving himself more chances to attack, buff himself on the first turn, and then attack on the second one, which can allow him to chain together some really disgusting damage. But then when the extra turn effect runs out, he'll waste a turn renewing it, thus giving you a chance to attack or heal. Ironically, you're the one with the extra turn now. In what is definitely not a metaphor for how big business types exploit rising stars for their own benefit, Grubba has slurped up so much fighter energy over the years that he's amassed a health pool of 60 HP. Quite a lot for this early in the game. Needless to say, Grubba got ripped. Damn, he's healthy. Grubba can really rock your socks if you're not careful, since he's got moves to cover for both offense and defense, which you make willing down his HP, let alone surviving a real ordeal. And you'd better survive, because if you don't win this encounter, then chances are Mario and friends will never be seen again. Also, I saw this one comment that said that King Dedede's voice from the Kirby anime is a perfect fit for Grubba, and I cannot unhear it now. That fool's lucky I didn't leave him on the cutting room floor! Oh, come now, little old me a hero? Surely you jested! That's right, I'm gonna show him some real star power! Ah! Help me! What is this, number six? More like number six. The fight with DJ Octavio is awesome. Aside from perhaps some of the fights found in the Splatoon 2 Octo expansion, the battle with DJ Octavio from the first game may well remain the most unique encounter in the series. The way bosses usually work in these games is that you're put into an arena with the boss, and then it's just you and them, mono a mono. DJ Octavio breaks this trend and foregoes the arena in favor of the fight being formatted more like a level. From time to time, Octavio will fire these large metal fists at you from his machine, and shooting them with ink will volume them back at Octavio, thus revealing more of the map. Then, after bullying his machine enough, Octavio will send out this large Octo Bump unit flag, which he'll actually volley back. Send it back enough times, and it's off to the next phase, of which there are five. In an ordinary fight, repeating this pattern of hitting back the fists and bombs will get repetitive, but that doesn't happen here because this fight is always making things up. As every time you successfully land a blow, there's new terrain to check out and maneuver on, utilizing the various platforming elements from earlier in the game. And of course, the mad DJ's attacks gradually get more intense as the battle continues. It starts off rather simple with these oct torpedoes that you can destroy with your shots, but then he starts mixing in killer whales that you need to avoid getting caught in, and firing bombs to spawn enemies to get in your way. There is never a dull moment with this fight, it's mostly 
attacks are fired either in sequence or simultaneously. You have to micromanage so many tiny things, and it keeps you on your toes in a really exhilarating way, as many attacks seem to exist solely to distract you from other attacks you need to focus on. The fists and Octobombs are the highlight of this fight. Sending these back is the only way to damage Octavia, which surely is the boss sign that bugs me, since the boss will be invincible if it just didn't do that one attack. And oftentimes, when a boss is designed around counterattacking, it messes a little more than tediously waiting for your opportunity to do damage. But here, it is incorporated perfectly. Octavia throws so much at you all at once that your main objective becomes just to survive the onslaught. You know, get out of the way, destroy those hazards before they become a problem, and so on. And this applies to the fists too, as hitting the fists back is the main way that you avoid that attack. And since firing at the fists also happens to progress the fight, there is no disconnect between dodging the boss's attacks and fighting back. Even if you don't immediately realize it, you're making progress. Leave it to a DJ and create a fight with the sickest flow and sense of rhythm. In case this still isn't making sense, let's compare this fight to the rematch with Octavio in Splatoon 2. First of all, the fight takes place in a circular arena, just like any other fight. And there's a lot more downtime between each of Octavio's attacks, so it's way easier to know how long it takes for him to do the fist attack. In the original fight, the fists always had a way of surprising you, since they came out while you're busy dealing with multiple other attacks, while here, the pace is a lot slower and feels more than the type of boss I was complaining about earlier. Heck, in this fight, Octavio even has a version of the fist attack that you can't send back, so why doesn't he just do that every time? This iteration of Octavio is interesting, because it's what the original fight could have been, standard, predictable, but serviceable, but instead we got a battle that truly went against the grain and delivered something incredible. In the last phase, Callie and Marie decide to step in, and Octavio's theme is overridden by the Calamari incantation for the final stretch. Octavio can't even help dancing to the beat, which is hilarious. The pressure is on, and you get a real sense of Octavio is pulling out all the stops as attacks overlap with each other. It's a real war of attrition, but with enough persistence, you'll knock Octavio out of his machine, deal the final blow, and you're done with him. Kaloktos. The ancient cistern from Skyward stores a place that seems innocent on the surface, with a pleasant atmosphere, calm waters, and nice music, but then takes a rather sinister turn when you have to descend into the nightmarish basement for it to grab the dungeon's boss key. After literally going to hell and back, you think there's nothing worse the dungeon could throw at you, but then it comes gear at him when it's the ancient automaton Kalactos that cut us down to size. When the fight begins, Kalactos will be rooted in the center of the room and will cover up its weak point with two of its hands. It attacks either by throwing two spinning blades your way or trying to smash it with its spare arms. Its arms get stuck in the floor when it does this, thus giving the opportunity to dismantle them with your whip. After you've broken both of these arms, the boss will try to smash you with its other two arms, thus leaving its weak point vulnerable. After taking advantage of the opportunity and slashing at it with your sword, Kalachos will reform its limbs and the cycle starts anew. At first, it seems like pretty standard stuff. But then... <laughs> It just got real. Kalaktos plucks itself from the ground, covers its weak point with a sturdy metal cage, and pulls out six gigantic cutlasses. Now standing at an intimidating height and making the ground quiver with every step, Kalaktos went from a slashing sentry to a colossal crusher, with every swing resonating with intensity and power. If you get close enough, it'll once again try to slam its way through your skull, thus getting its arms stuck in the ground again for you to dismantle. However, this time, just getting rid of the arms is not enough, due to the cage protecting the weak point that your goddess sword cannot cut through. But, as any diehard Berserk fan will tell you, there is no problem that cannot be solved by a bigger sword. So, after breaking Kalactos' arms with the whip, you're then able to grab one of its swords and go absolutely nuts with it. You obliterate its legs, making it immobile once again, and repeatedly slash at the cage until it's simply no more while probably inadvertently cutting off some of the boss's other limbs in the process. You're not just outsmarting the boss with your new toy, you're actually turning its own weapon against it. Suffice to say, this fight is nothing short of epic. Though it doesn't last long, as after taking enough damage, Kalactos will reform from its pieces again, including the sword you took, and reactivate the cage. You can't damage the boss until he manages to steal one of its swords again after it does this attack where it gets stuck in the floor, which is another Another example of the kind of boss attack I discussed during the DJ Octavio segment. And as I said, that would normally bother me, but I think it works here because it serves the overall narrative of this fight. You see, Kalaktos, and by extension the ancient sister itself, is heavily rooted in Buddhist myth. A famous example being the scene where you climb the threat of spider silk while being pursued by cursed bacoblins, which is in reference to an old Buddhist tale. And likewise, Kalaktos, with its three pairs of arms, is evocative of the many Buddhist statues that depict Buddha and other Buddhist deities as having many and even thousands of arms. Wait a fucking second! Three, six arms, two legs, that's eight limbs, spider's thread! 
Holy shit! However, Buddhist philosophy is all about pacifism, tranquility, and peace. The arms are not meant for combat, their purpose is to save living beings and lead them to enlightenment. But, that's where Girahim comes in. He didn't just bring Kalaktos to life, he corrupted it, so it no longer resembles the Buddha living in paradise, and more so resembles a demon from down below in hell. Kalaktos even summons cursed Makoblins during the fight, as opposed to the more paradisical enemies found elsewhere in the ancient cistern. Suddenly, this symbol of wisdom and self-control is lashing out violently with a beating heart of malice. It doesn't even seem to care that it's damaging the very temple it's meant to protect and likewise that it's striking so hard that it gets stuck in the floor. It doesn't care about the ancient cistern or protecting the ancient flame, it just wants you dead, and the force it uses to strike the ground shows how hard it's trying to kill you, which of course ends up being to its own detriment, as it is this clouded rage that allows us to gain the upper hand. Poetically, had Kalaktos been calm and collected instead of violent and angry, the fight would have been unwinnable. Wow. That just blew my mind. This is still the Legend of Zelda we're talking about, right? Well, whatever your philosophy, I think we can all agree that Kalaktos, the awe-inspiring ancient automaton, is a masterpiece of malicious machinery. <laughs> We'll be back after these messages. Kirby and the Forgotten Land is the most immaculate title on the Nintendo Switch. Kirby and the Forgotten Land covers stubborn stains, embarrassing posters, the mountain of uneaten hot pockets in your freezer, the insufferable despair of existence, and so much more. It will do your homework, help you find love, file your divorce papers, and offer emotional support during your darkest times. All of this could be yours for the low, low price of $59.99. Oh yeah, and it also comes with a bonus entire video game. Play it, I guess, and get mad at how unfair the tilt and tumble section is. No! At last, after clawing our way through six different bosses, we have finally found our footing at the final four. While the previous bosses were good on their own, they were merely just the build-up to these great final few. So enough introduction, it's time to pass the torch to the tortured king of Winter Scorch. history aside, Claws sits high atop the pantheon of Don't Starve Together's most imposing bosses. The beauty of this game is that if you don't know what you're doing, then things can go south very fast, which makes attempting each boss for the first time a pretty nerve-wracking endeavor, especially alone. And Claws is no exception, so I normally kill him with the old pan flute and gunpowder trick, but now it's time to be a freaking man for once. Hold on, just gotta change characters, that face some cheat codes, one of the best gear in the game. Alright, let's do this! You initiate the fight by getting your hands on a deer antler and use it to pick the lock on the loot stash. After doing so, the antler will break and Claws will walk in, clad in chains, stitches sewn over his eye and mouth, and with two no idea adorned with red and blue gems accompanying him. At this point, he will constantly pursue you while you're in range of the stash, and will swipe at you with his two claws if you get too close. Though Claws isn't the only Frez, the two gem deer will periodically buck you as well, and after Claws has taken enough damage, he'll summon two Krampuses... Uh... Cramp I... Cramps. Claws summons two cramps into the battle to go in and break your knees whilst he sits back and laughs at your misfortune. But the most deadly tool in Claws' arsenal is his Gem Deer, which you can call upon to cast one of two spells. The red Gem Deer creates a circle of heat that can set you on fire, and the blue Gem Deer creates a circle of cold that can freeze you. And the latter is the more dangerous one of the two because the loot stash, and by extension Claws, only spawns during winter, where freezing to death is already a constant concern. So whereas the overheating effect wears off quickly, the freezing effect may well remain and drain your health for a portion of the fight. At times, it can actually be to your advantage and make Claws initiate the fire spell so that you can negate the freezing effect. Now I know what you're thinking. If freezing is such a problem, just kill the blue gem deer then. The gem deer will allow Claws to cast these spells, so just take them out first. Well, that would be ill-advised, because doing so results in Claws becoming enraged, growing to a monstrous size with his health, damage, range, and so on being multiplied to an absurd degree. You shouldn't have done that. There's a reason his stash is filled with so much boss loot. Claws is no stranger taking other bosses' lunch money. And if you try to cheat him, he'll frickin' cheat you back. So just play by his rules and then eventually, with enough determination and a little luck, the Jolly Demon will fall. But then Claus comes back to life, his chains falling off in the process, thus revealing another mouth in his stomach that he can now use to lunge at you from long distances. And fun fact, the sniffing animation that Claus does in the first phase when idle is him doing a violent roar from his lower gut. See, he doesn't need to smell you anymore, because he can almost taste you. It was quite the fight that moonlit night, but despite his plight to smite me with frostbite, I escaped eternal paws at the jaws of Claus and lived to hoard trinkets another day. Though, just barely. Now, let's see what we got. Uh, 
a must light blueprint, a bee queen crown, some steel wool, thick fur, gold charcoal, and two life giving amulets. Yeah, I'd say this is worth it. <laughs> It was inevitable that we would get to Hollow Knight at some point. With a boss roster standing at over 40 strong, a top 10 ranking the best bosses from Hollow Knight alone could have been its own video. There's the Brooding Moloch, which is a deceitfully challenging fight for how early in the game you can face it. The Soul Master, which is a crazy dramatic fast-paced encounter. There's the fan-favorite Mantis Lords, who in the second phase will double up on their attacks, but Brothers Oromanto did the concept better. Who said that? There's True Master Grimm, who, believe it or not, was actually the reason I got this game. And then, of course, there's the Invincible. The Vigorous. The Terrifying. The mighty... <laughs> Zote. <laughs> oh yeah, most of these bosses have stronger variants, too. Dream bosses are fun, but with the exception of perhaps the Soul Tyrant, they really don't do it for me as much as the regular encounters. And a number of them are bullshit. But, there is one rematch that I think rises far above its original fight. That being none other than the dream of a great white knight. As the echo of the Dung Defender's former glory shining true, the White Defender is as elegant as he is chaotic. As you'd expect, the rematch features all the same attacks as the previous fight. The Defender can throw bouncing balls of dung and then roll into a bouncy ball himself, swim through the floor, dive into the ground and emerge among multiple dung balls, and then after doing enough damage, he'll enter a phase where he does the dive attack multiple times in quick succession. His Dreamborn counterpart brings back all of these attacks, but faster with more projectiles, as well as some new moves, too. He can now slam the ground to create four spike pillars of dung around him, his ball attack will now transition into the dive attack, which causes rows of these pillars to spread throughout the arena, and that old trick where you can interrupt the defender while he's underground using the desolate dive doesn't work anymore. The defender is a master at making you respect his personal space. If you're too close to him, it can often lead to you taking a hit, whether it be him slapping at you while throwing the dung, hitting you as he enters the swim routine, or the very quick spike move. You have to be very mindful of your position throughout the fight, unless you want to get sucker punched by a wad of crap, which is definitely important to keep in mind as when you beat the fight for the first time, you have the option to challenge it again, only now it does one extra mask of damage, stacking up to five. The mechanic where the boss gets stronger with each subsequent rematch is one of with Great Prince so the other hidden dreams boss. And it's incredibly telling, but I gave up on doing every version of that fight, but I didn't give up with the White Defender. Because God, Great Prince Zoda is an asshole. Every one of his attacks leaves shockwaves, he summons enemies and bombs that get in the way, and a handful of attacks behave in ways that can catch you off guard, which makes the extra damage from the rematches feel even more punishing. Whereas with the White Defender, there's a lot more of a method to the madness, and it never feels like you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. But it also keeps mixing things up with the order of its attacks, so the fight never gets repetitive or stale. I guess to put it simply, the White Defender is everything I love, about a Hollow Knight boss. It keeps up a fast pace, you have to be conscious of your surroundings, it's fun to evade the boss's attacks while mixing little taps for your nail, the patterns are really rewarding to learn, the visuals and score are just striking, and above all else is a brawl of the character you really come to like. All of which congeals into an elegant dance of a fight. Not too chaotic, yet not too orderly. Much like the Nail Master fights, it feels like a duel with your teacher, passing his skills on to the next generation, and it's perfectly encapsulated by a reward for completing all five iterations of the fight, where the defender wakes up and if you leave the room and come back, you'll find a little statue of the knight made of dung. Thus showing that the defender now recognizes you as a great knight on your own. Gross, but honorable. When you begin playing Just Shapes and Beats, there is nothing. Then, you appear, with the pink hazards and the boss falling shortly after. And once you defeat the boss, suddenly this world springs to life. Greenery all around, birds littering the land, and the sun comes down to show its appreciation for the beauty of it all. As you begin to explore this new world, you make a friend. You walk along the pastel pastures, you greet other kindly characters, and you even go down the water slide together. At first, it looks like it's going to be a good, peaceful existence. At least that is until the boss awakens from its forced hibernation and starts wreaking havoc, putting you and your new buddy on the run. And after the boss uproots the world tree and becomes the new world order, the two of you are separated, with you being shot to a nearby island and them being sent adrift. From this point onward, we start to see how aspects of this world are being corrupted, with many normally friendly faces becoming violent and evil, all culminating in the factory level, which seems to manufacture this corruption on a large scale. And worryingly, that very place is where your friend from earlier is about to wash up. There's a very tense atmosphere as you progress through the factory, interlaced with scenes of your friend making it further and further down the assembly line. And then when you make it to the end and find a piece of the world tree at the heart of the operation, the unthinkable happens.
In a sudden twist, after making it all the way through the factory, it's revealed that the boss of the area is actually your friend after being corrupted as well. And this opening to the fight is astonishing. It shows the boss apparently trying to fight back the corruption, crying as a result, because they don't want to hurt you, their best friend. But as it continues, more and more hazards begin to leak out, getting stronger and more potent the more time passes until eventually almost no blue shines among the writhing mass of pink. And then, what was once the first friendly face you met when you began your journey becomes the face of despair. <laughs> Just Shapes and Beats has a whole host of great memorable boss fights, from Barracuda to Final Boss to- Oh, hey, look, they put number 8 in the game. But none of them hit the same emotional beats as Close to Me, which also happens to be the longest song of the game, beating out even Annihilate. Your friend is in a lot of pain, and suffice to say, it's gonna last for a while, as they seem to have become intertwined with the Factory. In their first attack, their hands become claws, which they use to pull up the ground, nearly smothering you, complete with saws that appear and then fall from the ceiling. In the next attack, they turn to a large gear they have to dash into and out of to avoid being crushed. And in the final attack, saws to launch in all four directions, slicing across the edges of the screen. The fight mainly consists of these three attacks, separated by instances of your friend having a moral crisis about having to hurt you. And what's worse is that for a moment, they seem to break free, smoke erupting from them due to the physical and emotional stress of the situation. They try to crawl away from it, from the corruption, back to you, back to when everything wasn't so messed up, but despite their efforts, they just can't seem to reach you. You just aren't close enough. <laughs> It's little moments like this that turn this fight from a regular battle to a rocket-powered gut punch, all without dialogue, too. Just Shapes and Beats' story is told entirely with visuals, and as such, none of the characters have actual names. So while playing, I and many others just call them by nicknames, like Captain, Pilot, or Fresh. And the name I always gave to our favorite sad lad is... Friend. Best friend. Even the file name seems to agree, which I actually didn't know until now. And that's why rescuing them from the factory's clutches was so important, because close to me is the worst case scenario. You can really see how this fight is tearing them apart, evolving into a mess of claws, saws, and gears before grabbing all four sides of the screen and trapping you in a rotating box of saw blades. The claw attack, the gear, the saws, and now this attack where you have to hug the mill to survive. You all see it, each of these attacks are designed to keep you close to them. That's all they really wanted after all, and it's incredible how within these attacks this desire manages to shine through, even if it tragically can't work out. And so the fight ends, with your friend crying a spread of toxic tears, thus concluding a truly incredible and heartbreaking encounter. But, a big theme of this game is that no matter how bad things get, there will always be a way to succeed despite everything. You face adversity and trial every day, but that does not mean you should give up, as where there's despair, the sun always shines a ray of hope. Rainbow Road. But of course, before I reach our last boss at the top of its mighty tower, let's discuss some honorable mentions first. Plantera from Terraria. I can't quite put my finger on it, but there's just something a little badass about this fight. Perhaps it's the rock music that plays in the background, or how she can drop an axe bass guitar, which oddly enough is the strongest axe in the game, beating out even the endgame axes. Or how the boss is named after the real band Pantera, or no wait, yeah, it's the rock references. That's why this fight is so cool. Plantera even becomes enraged, claws stuff if you try to fight her above ground or in a bottom besides the jungle. Also, I like fly traps. Opal from Pokemon Sword and Shield. Opal is the leader of the fairy type gym found in Battle and Leah, which has this gimmick where you're asked quiz questions during battle. Answering correctly gives you a boost, and answering wrong weakens you. But where things get interesting is that this carries over to the fight with Opal as well, whose questions are legitimately designed to troll you. And it's an effective trolling because I somehow managed to get every single one of them wrong during my initial run. The first question she asked was if her nickname is the magic user or the wizard. I guess magic user because there's one thing Opal looks like and it's not a wizard, but apparently that was wrong. Oh well, I guess they mean the same thing anyway, it's just a matter of specifics, easy mistake. The next question is what if you're a color? is, pink or purple? And she is obsessed with pink, so I thought this one would be easy and pick pink, but turns out her favorite color is actually purple. And the whole pink thing was a deliberate misdirect. And at this point, I'm starting to stress out because I was doing a light nuzlocke and I didn't want any of my Pokemon to die because of this cone chicanery. And then she drops the final question. How old is she? 16 or 88? And I was like, yes, yes, an easy one. Answered 88, only for her to say that I was right. But my honest answer hurt her feelings, so she lowers my stats anyway. And I'm just like, no, 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 you witch. How can you do this to me? And I must say, 
It was quite a memorable encounter. I'm sure a number of people were annoyed by the game suddenly becoming Banjo Tooie, but I thought it was quite effective at raising the tension. Now, please, let's never do that again. The Frost King from Castle Crashers. Oh, look, it's the other King of Winter. This list ain't big enough for the two of us. Castle Crashers has a lot of fights worth discussing, but I gravitate towards the Frost King due to my natural affinity for the Blue Crasher. Frost King versus Frost Knight, it feels almost right. During the fight, you're subjected to ice physics, and the king can make ice spikes from the ground, teleport around, and point at you, making a laughing sound. Overall, this fight is quite cool. It's a nice encounter. It's good enough to make me give the evil wizard the cold shoulder. There's no way any other boss could open compete. The king's detestable personality is just the icing on top. You have to put a lot of thought on how you approach this fight. I scream for joy when I finally win the encounter. Much like the Frost King does, his body is slowly and painfully frozen over as his body grows cold and his life gradually slips away into a frosty face. Dr. Zomboss from Plants vs. Zombies. Before the 10th level of each stage in this game, you receive poorly scrawled letters written by the zombies about their crude quest to eat your brain. So you immediately know something is up when you reach the final level, and the letter you receive is both highly legible and in cursive to boot. This is the only nighttime level on the roof, Crazy Dave is abducted before the fight, and no zombies are visible on the other side. So you're left in suspense until... A giant robot steps in, which of course is piloted by the Brainiac Maniac himself, the ironic leader of the zombies, Dr. Edgar George Zomboss. The patented classic Zombot TM can summon zombies to the field, crush your plants using large RVs or its foot, drop bungee zombies down to abduct plants, and then periodically the head will come down, leaving Zomboss vulnerable as he summons balls of fire and ice to roll forward and crush your plants unless you do something to stop them. There's just something charming about this fight. Getting your chance to start wailing on the good doctor when the head comes down is always the most exciting part of the battle, as you finally get to show Zomboss what for. It's just so cool gratifying and really goes to show that sometimes a battle is its own reward. Actually, you know what? Let's have some dishonorable mentions too, because sometimes boss fights aren't always peachy keen and rainbows. And besides, when the hell else am I gonna talk about these guys? <laughs> Kratos and Delilah from Bug Fables. This is another classic example of a moderately easy game containing a deceitfully evil optional boss. Kratos has a whole lot of defense, a whole lot of health, and a whole lot of extremely powerful attacks. Meanwhile, Delilah can suck the life out of you and has a bazooka that can inflict you with all sorts of different status ailments. Oh yeah, when either of them reach half health, they get to attack twice per turn, like Macho Grubba, except the effect doesn't run out. Delilah is a huge pain. The status ailments she can inflict and the raw DPS from a bazooka are crazy dangerous, so you want to take her out first is what I would say, except that if either of them are down or low on health, then they can heal themselves using a Queen's Dinner, the best healing item in the game, restoring 15 HP to the entire party and healing all status conditions. And unfortunately, Stratos and Delilah seem to have an infinite supply and will always pull one out right when you think you've got a chance at winning. And so to actually win this fight, you have to, like, game the system and abuse the game's mechanics in ways that don't feel deliberate just to prevent them from healing. And the thing is, if they didn't abuse items so much, this probably would have been an alright super boss, but instead we got an ear-splitting headache of a fight. And while we're on the topic of crazy post game Super bosses, Volo from Pokemon Legends Arceus. Throughout Legends, you definitely get a suspicious vibe from Volo, seems so surprisingly knowledgeable on a number of things, and even tags along for a good portion of your journey. And then after you've acquired almost all the elemental plays from the various legendary Pokemon, Volo turns on you and is revealed to actually be Cynthia's great great ancestor. Yeah, that's Cynthia. And he has her exact team at very high levels to boot. But not just her team, he also has Giratina. Twice! He sends out Garatina after you defeat his last Pokemon, and then when you defeat Garatina, he gives it the grissiest orb and a max revive! He basically has eight Pokemon, including a legendary! That's insane! If you're just playing through the game casually, by the time you face Volo, he will just absolutely steamroll you unless you go out and grind a bunch. Or do what I did and assemble a team of all the legendary Pokemon I caught on the way here. And even with a full team of legendaries, it was still so hard! It just blows my mind how high the odds are stacked against you in this fight. Ding dies from Cuphead. Everyone has their own personal Cuphead boss that just gives them hell, and that is a little bit of the fun of this game, but I am putting my foot down at King Dice. The fight revolves around this obnoxious casino gimmick where you have to parry this dice block to advance on the crafts table, where nine of the slots send you to a different one-phase boss fight. Then, once you make it to the end, you square off with Dice himself. And the thing is, I don't even believe that this is the hardest boss in the game, but it's just so long! Not just because you have to deal with four phases at least and ten phases at most, but because between phases, you have to worry about getting the timing on this die right so the fight doesn't take any longer than it needs to. So then it super sucks when you spend all that mental energy on the die only to yourself die on the last phase and start all over. It's so tedious. Not even the fights I actually had trouble with made me want to quit like this one did. You know, I'm noticing a pattern. Long encounters with no checkpoints are just soul crushing. Which brings us to... Ballows from Cave Story. If there was a difficulty spike that I should have talked about way back when, but didn't, it would be this one. The Sacred Grounds, aptly nicknamed Hell, is one of the most unreasonable post-game areas I've ever seen. An extremely treacherous gauntlet of falling stones, tons of enemies, limited health and energy drops, and five 
separate boss encounters, four of which belong to Balos. First, he's just a tough dude, then he becomes a giant head, then he summons a bunch of littler giant heads that you have to attack, and then in the final phase, he spawns orbiting platforms they have to stay on to avoid the slice on the floor with his littler giant heads suddenly protecting him from harm. And all of that is after the entire sacred grounds area and a separate boss, all with no checkpoints. Balos' attack patterns aren't even that hard to learn, but because simply getting to the fight is an ordeal on its own, you're hardly able to retain much. And as a result of the sudden jump in difficulty, this place has haunted me ever since I was a child, since I can never manage to beat it. It is just so much at once, and because it gets so chaotic with so much visual noise, it can be easy to take a hit or even die without realizing what the hell just happened. And here we are. After a journey alive with love and loss, we at last arrive at our final boss. Much like how the boss is the one in charge of all the regular enemies, the final boss is the one in charge of all the bosses. The head, head vampire. And I'll share with you a secret. Close to me was originally number one when I first conceived of this video. But at the very last possible moment, the spot was stolen by our ultimate enemy. Much like how he stole Kirby's wish. A staple of the Kirby series is the arena, a boss rush mode where you fight all the game's bosses in a row, capped off by the final boss. It got its start in Kirby Superstar, but it was the remake, Kirby Superstar Ultra, that brought us the true arena. This version features all the bosses added in Ultra, replaces all the maximum tomatoes with regular tomatoes, and later will become a staple in its own right. Though despite it being a long-standing series tradition, there is no topping the dripping tension present in the original true arena. When you select the true arena, it shows this really dramatic opening cutscene that mirrors the regular arena's opening cutscene. Only at the end of this one, you are greeted by the final four, the tortured king of winter, the Great White Knight, the Face of Despair, and the final opponent, who we only get a glimpse of. As a kid, this buildup was huge. I racked my brain trying to figure out what the last enemy could be, despite the fact that everyone was accounted for. After all, they were all bosses I had already beaten, right? Mass Deity from Avenger the King, Wham Bam Jewel from Hellboy to Hero, and Galacta Knight from Meta Nightmare Ultra. Every new mode in Superstar Ultra was capped off with a brand new boss, and well, little did I know, this applied to the true arena as well. So after scraping our way through six separate bosses, and then the first three members of the final four, we are greeted by the vengeful Spirit, Mark's soul. When the fight begins, you find yourself in some kind of cosmic dimension, with a floor made up of rainbow hexagons and a background consisting of coalescing splotches of color. It is in this strange place that we are greeted by Mark's soul proper, now with a more accentuated look that trades out what little cuteness the character once had in favor of violent insanity. Marks will often fly up to where he can't reach them and drop seeds from high up above They can grow into rosy vines where they land, followed by him bursting out of the floor to try and get the drop on you. He can fire arrows from across the screen, drop ice bombs from his mouth, mince you with doubled up cutters, shoot- <laughs> And of course, most infamously, Mark's soul can split himself in half to become two large balls of energy that sweep across the screen, a volley of paint raining down from above, and even summon a black hole. Since Marx is constantly moving, teleporting around, and often invulnerable during his attacks, landing a decent hit can be tricky, while taking a lot of damage is deceitfully easy. Marx must be pretty good pals with Sabu. And let's not forget that this fight is preceded by the entirety of the true arena, which is very stingy when it comes to health pickups. So it'll be quite often that you enter this fight without even being at max health. And if you die during this fight, you die in real life. <laughs> and if you die during this fight, then you have to start all over from the beginning and fight through the true arena again. Fight through Cabby. Fight through Mass Deity, fight through Galacta Knight, just to get another crack at Marks. There are no tricks to getting ahead of the curve here. No exploits, no smuggling food into the arena, and no retrying after dying to the final fight. Someone at Hell Labs must have been a really big fan of what they did with Marks here. Because from this point onward, every arena will be capped off with a new tougher version of the final boss as one last surprise twist. All of whom sharing the same moniker of Soul. Yeah, 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 technically Drossia was the first Soul boss, but it wasn't until Marks that it truly became a staple. Especially since Squeak Squad came up between camp is cursed and Superstar Ultra, yet has no such thing, despite the fact that it does have a boss rush. But wait, I hear you say, the cutters. Every soul boss has this cutter attack, including Mark's soul, Drossia's soul, 
and marks in both Kirby Superstar Ultra and Kirby Superstar from 1996, nine years before Canvas Curse! I don't believe it. It's not an element of the Soul Bosses, they're all just copying marks! And you know, both the original game and the remake tell the same story, so who's to say that after being flying to Nova, meeting a grizzly alien death in the original Kirby Superstar, Mark's soul didn't form shortly afterwards, and has been waiting 12 whole years to get his twisted revenge. I cannot stress enough how much of a mind blow it was to be greeted by Marks again at the end of the true arena. From the mystery to that incredibly unsettling cutscene to even the reveal of his name, it is impossible to understate that Mark's soul may well be the most important fight in Kirby history. And indeed, the most legendary boss fight from my childhood. After finding out that Marks was alive, or undead rather, it was on. I challenged the true arena over and over and over, failing many, many times. Until one day during the scuffle with Mark's soul, I found that there was just one hit standing between me and the title of Kirby Master. Yeah.